Since before they hid the state charter in an old oak tree, Connecticut citizens have been growing our democracy. But new data says not every branch is thriving. Tonight, we'll see where the growth has flourished or been checked, and ask if new ways of thinking about citizenship can create an even stronger democracy that flourishes for everyone. Join us now from Connecticut's old state house for a town hall meeting, Great Citizenship, Building a Better Connecticut. Sponsored by Connecticut's Old State House, CTN, the Connecticut Network, Everyday Democracy, Data Haven Incorporated, and the Office of the Secretary of the State. Made possible by generous funding from Connecticut Humanities and by support from these partners. Good evening, I'm Diane Smith, and I'd like to open our program this evening with a thought from our main speaker tonight, Eric Liu, who said, if the undocumented have to work hard to attain citizenship, those of us who already are citizens should have to work hard to sustain it. We should all have to serve more, vote more, build more, and do more for our country. And I'd like to add, for our state as well. So how do we build a better Connecticut? That's our theme tonight. We have gathered a very diverse and interesting audience here for you to talk about this topic, as well as a distinguished panel of guests, and I'd like to introduce them now. Start with Alma Meyer who is the former town clerk in the city of Bridgeport. She is now working on uh, the mayor's staff, uh, Mayor Joe Gannam, and a longtime activist in the Latino community. Welcome. I also would like to introduce Professor Bilal Siku. He is a political scientist from the University of Hartford. Thank you for being here. Eric Liu is the author and founder of Citizens University. We welcome you here from the West Coast. And we have uh, Professor Richard Brown. He is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Connecticut and our Secretary of the State, Denise Merrill. And now I would like to introduce Martha McCoy. Martha is the Executive Director of Everyday Democracy, and she's also the co-chair, along with Denise Merrill, of the Connecticut Citizens Civic Health Advisory Group, which has been doing a very interesting study about behavior and civic engagement in our state. And I'll let Martha tell you more about it. Martha? Thanks, Diane. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Everyday Democracy, the Secretary of the State's Office, the Connecticut Civic Health Advisory Group, CTN, and the Old State House, welcome to this town hall meeting on great citizenship. And we're really happy you're here, and we thank you for being here, and we also thank um, the Connecticut Humanities uh, Fund, the William Casper Graustein Memorial Fund, and Campus Compact for making this evening possible. So we all know that we hear lots of news these days about dissatisfaction and about what it is to live in Connecticut and how does it feel to live in Connecticut. Something very important is often missing from those conversations and those polls, and that is the notion of civic health. In our society, we track all kinds of things. We track the economy, we track politics, we track sports, but we very rarely track our civic health and say, how are we doing on that and what can we do about it? So what is civic health? It's really the state of our public well-being. It's how we contribute as individuals and families to the life of the community, how we relate to each other and to other community members, to our family members, and to institutions. How we connect and work with others in our everyday lives provides the foundation for how we work together in our public life. What we do in pre-political settings like families, neighborhoods, workplaces, schools, faith communities, barber shops, and book groups are the things that help us form the foundation of how we connect with others, how we respect and find our voice. Um, it also prepares us for using our voice to be heard by public officials. So another part of the story of civic life is not just us as individuals, but it's how welcoming are the opportunities in our state and in our country for us to use our voices and to work together. Uh, what do institutions across our state and across our country do to create those opportunities? So we're all affected by civic health, and we all have something to contribute to it. So in a place that has good civic health, what does that look like? There are places and habits and supports for people to connect with each other, work across difference, have a voice to vote, but also to struggle together and to have tough conversations and to figure things out together and to take action together. 
Recent research shows that, quote, a community with strong civic health is more resilient when hardship hits, has more effective governance, and is a better place to live. And that is the reason we formed the Connecticut Civic Health Project a few years ago. We began to work with the National Conference on Citizenship to start measuring how Connecticut was doing in terms of its civic health. How were we doing on the indicators? How did we compare with other states? What did it look like? How did we compete with each other? We wanted to not only get the knowledge of how we were doing for the sake of the knowledge, but we wanted it in order to do something about it. We wanted to see the areas we should celebrate and the areas we should change. So this year's civic health report shows that we're doing relatively well in some ways, but we have some areas to work on. We have relatively strong civic health by some measures, rising participation in talking with our neighbors, working with neighbors on a specific issue, eating dinner with our family members, it's good to know we're doing pretty well on that, and contacting public officials. But there are a couple of key areas and uh, on the panel, people will go into some specifics on key areas this evening. But there are a couple of key areas in particular that I want to highlight before I introduce Eric. First, there are significant disparities in civic participation between residents who are 18 to 24 and those who are 25 and older. Since the active voice and participation of young people and young adults are so critical to our civic health, we really need to pay attention to that. And a lot of young people and young adults in our state are doing something, and it's our job, the rest of us, to pay attention and to support what they are doing. Second, there are large gaps in wealth and education in our state, and they continue to form opportunity gaps in civic participation everywhere. These are often correlated with racial and ethnic background, and at times with gender. So we're going to hear about some of these inequities this evening. But in brief, what we see is that strong participation in neighborhood groups and community groups and faith groups does not always translate into having a voice in public policy and having a voice and a seat at the table when it comes to state level boards and commissions, for example. And so we know that we have on that measure and many other measures of these civic gaps of opportunity that we have to work on in our state. And because of the striking segregation in Connecticut, we have to be really intentional about creating connections across people from different backgrounds or else it will not happen. We have to meet together to address these inequities head on and we need to have that conversation in the context of the conversation about civic health. So, Given that context of what it is that we are dealing with, it's a special honor for me to introduce Eric Liu, whose life and career speak directly to our challenges here in the state. Eric is a powerful and prolific writer and speaker on civic health and great citizenship. He has brought outstanding leadership to pol politics, to media, and to business. He's a regular columnist for CNN.com and for The Atlantic, and other places too numerous to mention. But I first had the pleasure of meeting Eric several years ago and hearing him speak at one of his citizen universities in Seattle. He really portrays great citizenship as something that can be cultivated, something we can do something about, and he inspires all of us to think about that, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say and to having a rich conversation around it tonight. Thank you for being here, Eric. Thank you, Martha. Well, um, let me begin by uh, actually extending a round of thanks to many people, uh, Martha and Val and the whole team at Everyday Democracy for bringing us together, um, the uh, team here at the Old State House, which is just a, a jewel, a real jewel of, uh, of democracy, uh, and of course uh, our friends uh, um, as well um, at CTN um, for making it possible to reach so many other citizens of the state for tonight's conversation. We also have a couple of, at least a couple of dignitaries um, in the room tonight. I want to acknowledge one, of course, on our panel, our Secretary of State here. Uh, and the other, you may not have realized that we are in the presence uh, of our governor as well, or actually our kid governor, uh, Elena Tipton. Please rise, governor, if you would, um, who is... <clears throat> I 
I met Elena earlier this evening and um, learned that um, through a program run in part by the uh, old state house, uh, um, she is the first uh, kid governor uh, of the state of Connecticut and uh, was one of uh, uh, hundreds of people around the state, young people, who uh, submitted applications, uh, nominations uh, uh, to uh, hold this position. Uh, and she was selected uh, because of her campaign theme and the video that she submitted on this uh, uh, in, her, uh, in her campaign, which was kindness. Kindness. And having spent some time uh, with Elena and actually in her office, which is uh, uh, right around the corner here, uh, she, ha she has an office. You can make an appointment. She has a desk uh, with her nameplate on it. Um, and sp having spent some time with her um, talking about what she's been doing going around this state, uh, talking to um, other um, uh, young people uh, and people uh, much older than her, frankly, um, about kindness. Uh, it's a real fundamental uh, centering and reminder of what the heck we're doing here. You know, a place like this with the history that it has um, and in times like these where people are so focused on institutions of power and they're focused on the, the kind of scheming and maneuvering um, that goes along with institutions of power uh, and they're focused as well on politics as this uh, thing that we sit back as spectators and enjoy. Um, maybe we watch it like a reality TV show, right? Um, and in times like these, we need to be reminded that that is not the purpose of citizenship in a republic, to sit back like spectators. The purpose of citizenship in a republic is to actually show up for one another, to be able, at a human scale like we have in this room right here, see one another and hear one another, and by so doing, and showing just a little bit of empathy and showing a little bit of concern and a little bit of imagination, actually be kind and actually see that we are woven together in some profound ways. And, um, you know, as it always should be, um, we, the adults, um, are to be led and taught again by the children. And uh, thank you, Kid Governor, for, um, for all that you're doing. Um, I, I, it's actually kind of a perfect... Um, segue into some of the things that I wanted to open up with uh, uh, in my remarks in this first segment. Uh, as Martha uh, said, I run an organization called Citizen University, uh, and we do work all around the United States, uh, fundamentally trying to democratize understanding of how power works in civic life. And that work takes many forms. It takes the form of convenings and gatherings and conferences. It takes the form of curriculum of various kinds for different groups, whether it's students or veterans groups or immigrant groups or what have you. Uh, but all of it is about really trying to get uh, more of our fellow Americans uh, to see that we are co-owners. We are co-creators uh, of this country and of our civic life. And a big part of that work uh, is informed by uh, a book that uh, I, I wrote a couple of years ago called The Gardens of Democracy. Uh, and I was asked, uh, just in providing some opening framing remarks this evening, to say a word or two about what that book is and about the ideas of that book. And it's, uh, if you'll just indulge me for a few minutes, um, uh, I, I will, because it's very connected to what Martha was saying about these times in our country and even these times in Connecticut. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge right off the bat, I mean, as we sit here today, your newspaper in this town has in its headlines just, you know, evidence of the uh, decline of... Um, belief in our common future uh, and a sense of frustration uh, that so many of your fellow Connecticut residents feel uh, about economic life, about civic life, and political life. Uh, and when I wrote The Gardens of Democracy, um, I was making an argument. And the argument actually is contained in the title itself, that democracy is a garden. And in order to kind of understand and unpack that argument, I just want to back up a half step and invite all of you to just zoom out kind of one focal length and think about what it is that we do uh, when we live like Americans. When we live like Americans, what we do oftentimes is we live as consumers. We have incredibly, massively overdeveloped consumer muscles and incredibly atrophied, pitiful citizen muscles, right? Uh, and as consumers, we see ourselves, particularly in an age of mass capitalism, we see ourselves as parts of a big machine or parts of many connected big machines. And so the metaphors we use in civic life, just our simple everyday language, is mechanistic. It's machine language. 
When people talk about the economy, they talk about whether it's firing in all cylinders or whether the job creation engine is stalling. Uh, when people talk about government, uh, they talk either about political machines or also, you know, even your relationship to government is often described in terms of uh, a, a frustrated customer who's put coins into the vending machine and didn't get the candy bar they wanted, and now your choice is either to, you know, walk away frustrated or try to knock over the machine, right? But this machine language suffuses so much of our political and economic life. And, you know, there's some usefulness to a machine metaphor, but what I want to invite you to do is to recognize that we are not machines. We are not machines within machines. That to be a citizen is not to be some atomistic part of some perfectly perpetual motion, efficient operation, uh, efficiently operating uh, mechanism. That to be a citizen is to be part of a living body. That we are all of one body. And when you think in those terms of living systems, of complex adaptive systems, of actual ecosystems like our environment, and you think about that on a human scale, what you realize is the metaphor of a garden says far more and tells us far more truth about our lives together than the metaphor of a machine. That the economy, properly understood, is a garden. That our civic life in community and in neighborhood, properly understood, is life in a garden. That our political life is life in a garden. And the thing about gardens, for any of you who actually have one or have ever been near one, you know that gardens, when left to themselves, in a laissez-faire philosophy, will Go like, they'll grow like gangbusters for a while. They'll look awesome. Things will grow and flower. Uh, but if you continue and extend that laissez-faire philosophy and continue to be hands-off about that garden, guess what happens? Noxious weeds begin to take hold. And then over time, those noxious weeds began to begin to take over the entirety of the garden and begin to choke off the rest of the diversity of life and growth in that garden. And so to be in democracy, to be in fellowship, in a space like this, or just in a state like this, is to be a gardener of our democracy. It is to seed, to weed, and to feed civic life. And some of the things that Martha was describing in the Connecticut Civic Health Index and in the report that uh, uh, she and her colleagues have done is really a testament to these acts of seeding, weeding, and feeding. To volunteer or not to volunteer. To dine with your family or not dine with your family to work with other neighbors on addressing a problem or to just kind of pass it off to somebody else to deal with. These are the little acts of gardening uh, that indeed uh, add up to a healthy democracy. And our task, uh, not only this evening, but our task particularly at this moment in the country's history uh, is to remember that we know how to do this. And that's the key. I think we've been trained over the course of a generation and a half now of kind of politics as entertainment, politics mediated through screens. You know, we've been trained to uh, imagine that all we got to do is watch a show about gardening or watch a show about the cooking, uh, but not, not actually have to weed, seed, feed, or make anything ourselves, right? Uh, and our job right now uh, in this city, in this state, in this country is to remember what it means actually to get our hands a little bit dirty, what it means to ask one another, hey, what should we grow here? Ask ourselves, hey, is this garden growing in the way that we, sh that we would like it to? Uh, is the way that it's growing creating inequities uh, such that some things are flowering and towering and others are languishing in the shade thereby created? All of these questions are our questions. Uh, and for me, great citizenship fundamentally is identical with being in mind, spirit, and skill a great gardener of our democracy. Thank you very much, Eric. That was a great way to start off the program, and I hope everyone um, has a chance now to get an idea of Eric's work and some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, but thank you. That was terrific. Um, I want to just give us a chance to look a little bit more deeply into the Connecticut Civic Health Index, and we do have a few graphics here that I wanted to show you. The first one shows that in the 2012 presidential election, whites voted much more frequently than Latinos. African Americans, somewhere in the middle, but nowhere near 100% voting. The highest number of voting were among whites, and that was 66%. We have another graphic here that shows us that in that same election, fewer than half of people aged 18 to 24 voted, while two-thirds of people 25 and older voted, but still only two-thirds of people voting. And one more look 
Income and education are very much linked for people who voted in 2012, as you can see, based on whether you have a high school diploma, whether you have a, a bachelor's, whether you have an income of $35,000 or $75,000 and up, uh, was a big predictor of whether you were going to vote. And another measure of civic engagement, as Eric mentioned, it's not just about voting. People who earn more and have more education volunteer more than other people. So why is that happening, and what are the barriers to other people getting involved? Well, I'd like to start with our Secretary of the State, Denise Merrill. Denise, you really got this whole project going. I'd like you to talk a little bit more deeply about what we just heard and, and what Eric had to say. Sure, thank you, and thank you, Diane, for this great program, and thank you, Mr. Liu, for coming and talking about it. I happen to be a huge gardener, actually, so I love the metaphor. I love getting my hands dirty. That probably says something about me with my political career. But, um, and, it, and it's very striking that it, it really mirrors what we found when we did this study. You know, the Civic Health Index was an interesting project because we really thought it was going to be just an index, a, a look at what's going on. And it really sprang from the work of a guy named Robert Putnam who wrote a book famously a couple of uh, decades ago now, Bowling Alone, which was, which was saying essentially there's something going on in American culture. There's something going on in society that's new, that's different, and that people were not relating to each other in the same ways that they were in previous generations. And that did bear out, but we also knew people are still relating to each other. They're still doing things out there. They may not be voting, and that happens to be a particular interest of mine. And honestly, this election, I may have to throw out all my speeches on this topic because we've been saying, you know, young people aren't voting, Latinos aren't voting, and that may all change <laughs> very quickly. Uh, but, you know, what we found was indeed what we suspected that groups of people and people in general are relating to each other just in different ways. So they may not be voting, but they may be, uh, more, they may be very active in their church, for example, and in certain cultures and certain groups. That's much more relevant to people, perhaps, than voting. So um, if you go back to this metaphor of needing to um, create opportunities for people to come into, whether it's the political system or a church or a group of any kind, to kind of uh, counteract the fact that I think almost everything seems to conspire to keep us apart. You know, new technology, uh, cars even, you know, we drive past things now where we used to walk past them. So if, you're, if we're looking for ways to understand what people are doing out there, um, this, was, this is what we came up with in our report. The most important thing that I got out of our first report was people need to be asked in. That it, it's a very simple idea, but very profound if you think about it. Um, that you don't necessarily join groups unless somebody asks you in. And I like to think of that in the same way that I think about elections and voting and political activity. And I remember my very first race uh, for office, I would never have considered running for office, but someone said, gee, you know, you'd be really good on the Board of Education. And I thought, really? <laughs> um, okay. But, you know, that's a great example. I don't think I would have thought it up on my own. So, so when I think about this idea of tending a garden and, and getting involved and getting your hands dirty, I think we need to think very seriously about how we invite people in. And I've tried to make that kind of a hallmark of what I've been doing in Connecticut in terms of trying to make voter registration easier for people, systems generally more friendly to people. It, it's a small thing, but it's something I felt that we could do and it would be important. And now it looks like there are other things people had in their minds. It came through that people were dis feeling disenfranchised, especially certain groups, and this was no surprise, these slides about the disparities in our state. The old two Connecticut's, it's a very familiar theme. However, um, it also came through that there are ways to invite people in and we should be doing more of that. So I guess I'll stop there and let others have a shot. Thanks, Secretary. Uh, Bill, I'd like to go to you because um, when you were analyzing some of the data in that report, what specifically showed up to you was the gaps in education and income. 
and how those are predictors of how involved people are. And yet, in a state where we generally have a pretty high level of education and they fairly, you know, uh, among the, the tops in wealth overall, uh, the state shows up sort of in the middle of the pack, not at the top, as you would expect. How do you... For me, reading through, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was the fact that on a number of indicators, the state actually was in the middle of the pack on, on some of those things, and I was kind of surprised by that. But then I think when you look at the total picture, and this is where the income and the race and the other sort of inequalities within the state actually contribute to why the state actually lags behind some other states on some of those indicators. And I think, you know, the Secretary and Ms. Lewis have really brought out, I think, some of the issues that I think are particularly important in thinking about, you know, political participation and civic engagement in general. And I think the idea of, you know, mobilization and how we bring people out to the polls is vitally important. I think there is this sort of relationship, uh, you know, that you brought up about this idea, what are the expectations of citizens in a democratic society? Often we think about the institutions and you know, things outside of the individual, but what responsibilities do we have in terms of levels of interest, in terms of knowledge, in terms of our own sort of engagement in activities beyond voting? I mean, we focus a lot on voting, but if, what this study shows, there are lots of ways for people to become engaged. And those gaps may in fact, and I believe they do, translate into also problems of voice and representation in our political system. So to the extent that you see people who have less income, less education, racial and ethnic minorities who are less engaged in the political system, even beyond voting, it also translates into public policy and other things that favor those who have those advantages and are engaged. And so, this study really, I think, provides us with some key insights into some of the sort of systemic and deeply rooted challenges we face um, in a society that calls itself a democratic society. Yeah. Uh, Alma, uh, you have been a, a, an activist for a long time in Bridgeport uh, in the Latino community. You were the town clerk, um, and so you were extremely interested in people voting. Uh, but as we saw in that uh, data that we had, Latinos seem to be less inclined to vote than others. What are some of the reasons for that? Well, first I wanted to agree with um, our Secretary of State about that invitation because I got involved civically because somebody invited me. Um, and um, I remember going to my first Common Council meeting and got pushed and said, go say something. And I kept saying, but who's going to listen to me? They'll oh, go say something. And so I did, and they listened, and I went, wow, okay. <laughs> I could do this, you know. And even running for town clerk, it was the same thing. You should run for town clerk. Really? Why? And so I, and again, got pushed by people saying, yeah, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I did. And I think that that invitation is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I think that when it comes to Latinos, um, we are, uh, uh, we believe in relationships. Mm -hmm. And we nurture relationships. And when you get that invitation, it's because somebody wants you to be with them in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if we want Latinos to vote, we have to invite them in mm -hmm. and, and educate them on why it's important for them. And to talk about the little things that impact their daily life, because sometimes going out and trying to register people to vote and knocking on doors, mm -hmm. people have said to me, well, how's that going to change my life? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't. It really doesn't. You know, if I vote for president, is it really going to change my life? Not, probably not, you know. Um, so trying to get them civically engaged on a local level, I think, is more important. Mm -hmm. To vote for your council person, to vote for your board of ed person, that's really going to change things for you. And I think that's where we have to begin is let's, let's start locally, uh, whether it's even on a parent, uh, a PAC, mm -hmm. a parent advisory council to invite parents to say, you know, you should run for the president of your PAC mm -hmm. because that's going to affect your children's life. I'd like to let Mr. Liu uh, comment there because I see how you're nodding at what Alma is saying. Well, I think uh, there's so much here to respond to that I, I agree. I mean, first of all, this idea of invitation uh, is so fundamental. Um, and, and it's striking that um, two uh, currently in four, you know, elected officials uh, had to be invited. And, uh, but at first, your first reaction was, who, me? Really? Right? And 
Uh, and I think that's true with women on a lot of uh, uh, political arenas, but I think it's true of humans in general, right? Um, your, your first instinct is, who, me, right? And I think the invitation does matter, but this, this relational piece uh, that Alma's describing uh, and the focus on the local, um, I, I could not agree with more. The, the, we're, we're in a moment right now where because the presidential election is so um, you know, all-consuming and uh, fascinating, um, it, it is very easy to think that that's really the, 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 the focal point of our politics. But you know, all citizenship is local, just like all politics is local. Right? And all of these habits, and really what we're talking about is habits. Right? The, the, the question of why should I vote today for president or for anything else? Will it really change my life? Maybe, maybe not. But the habit of you voting over the course of a lifetime and the habit of you making that contagious over the course of a lifetime with other people, that will definitely change your community, right? Uh, and that is seen most vividly um, in a place of human scale at the local. Um, we've got this uh, project that I'll, I'll say a little bit more about later, but it's uh, at Citizen University called The Joy of Voting. And all we're doing in four cities around the United States, in Akron, Miami, Philly, and Wichita, uh, is we're getting together groups of artists, activists, neighbors, uh, active citizens, uh, to come and try to figure out what would be some creative, joyful rituals and shared experiences based on relationship that we could create that would be relevant to our town's culture and history that would make voting not eat your vegetables, but join the club, join the party, <laughs> right? Um, and so in all these cities, you got people coming up with great open-air debates, street theater, kind of, you know, kids on flatbed trucks, enacting plays, and all, all this stuff that is just about joyful participation, right? And I think it's harder to do that as a citizen of the United States voting for the president of the United States, but sure is easy to do that, um, you know, at the scale of Bridgeport or the scale of, you know, Meriden or anything else like that, uh, where you can feel and see um, the texture of your community. I like that idea of join the party. Uh, Professor Brown, um, you're our historian here. Um, tell us a little bit about what citizenship meant in the early days of the Republic versus how we view it now. Well, <clears throat> uh, citizenship initially uh, was based on birth in a particular place, and if you were born there, you were a subject and a citizen. Uh, I think we probably still mostly view it that way, though one of the things that strikes me when one connects it with voting is that, you know, the United States was founded on the principle of no taxation without representation. And for that reason, there were initially no citizenship requirements for voting. Uh, tax paying was the key factor. And uh, in fact, um, President Lincoln uh, was elected with many votes from non-citizens. Uh, they had been residents, let's say, of Michigan or Wisconsin or Illinois uh, for 12 months, but they were not citizens of the United States, but they were taxpayers, and they were regarded as members of the body politic uh, in those states. And indeed, Lincoln campaigned uh, especially for immigrant votes, uh, people who are not citizens. So I think it's kind of interesting that now uh, there is uh, such a profound uh, jointure, connection between uh, citizenship and voting. Uh, so that's, that's one thought. But I, I also wanted to comment a little bit on this uh, index of civic health as I was reading it over. And uh, what jumped out at me was not exactly new, that is that young people are less likely to vote. Uh, I heard, you know, 40 years ago from an old Boston Paul that people vote, you know, 20% of the 20-year-olds, 40% of the 40-year-olds, 60% of the 60-year-olds, 80% <laughs> of the 80-year-olds. And he said, you know, that's sort of the basic uh, fact of life in politics. But what I was thinking about was the way that Sanders has uh, mobilized a lot of young voters, just as uh, Gene McCarthy and George McGovern did uh, in relation to the Vietnam War in the late 60s and early 70s. And I was thinking about, well, what are the issues that 
uh, mobilized these young people? Well, in the case of the Vietnam War, it was particularly the draft. Uh, and the idea of being drafted and sent into a fight in which you had no particular commitment or stake was uh, not something lots of young people wanted to do, and so it got them interested in politics. Similarly, I think uh, this is, these are not the only issues that Sanders has uh, employed, but I think they are issues that have mobilized young people, and they are tuition, health care for young people uh, who may not be covered by any other insurance. And, you know, that seems to me to point to the, the issue of whether there are public issues that engage people's immediate interest, whether they perceive it that way. And I think of young people as, to a large extent, being self-involved. Uh, it's, it's part of the stage of life. They're frequently not embedded in community because they're away uh, from home and, and haven't settled on a community. So uh, I think that certain kinds of issues, and if there is leadership, and I think Sanders has provided an interesting kind of seemingly authentic leadership, uh, that, that do mobilize uh, 18 to 24-year-olds. And it's interesting, I, I don't want to go on at great length, but I'm struck that the other thing that happens with young people is they get their driver's licenses. You can bet they use their driver's licenses. They're qualified to vote, and they have a driver's license, and you know which one they use more frequently. Thank you, Professor. Um, when we were talking about local government and how keeping it local makes it so much more real to people, um, I wanted to introduce Suzanne Bates. Suzanne, would you stand, please? Suzanne is with the Yankee Institute. And um, Suzanne, um, I think that the Yankee Institute probably would say that simplicity in government and small size is what's important. Absolutely. I think that um, you know, as government becomes so big and complicated and centralized, um, fewer people see themselves reflected in their government. Um, and it, you know, it sort of makes people back away. Um, it's when, really at that local level that I think civic engagement is still thriving. Um, you know, but as you move up the chain, I think sometimes you have a harder time seeing yourself. Um, and, you know, there's that two-way responsibility. Um, the government has a responsibility as well to remain functional and um, friendly to the people that it serves in order for them to feel engaged um, as well. So, and I have to say too, I, I'm actually an immigrant to the United States. I moved here from Canada in 1995 and um, became a citizen in 2010. And it was so exciting to vote, you know, and, and, and love voting every time. It, there's nothing like not being able to do something that makes you really excited to uh, have the opportunity to do it. But. Well, thank you for joining the party. Uh, since we were talking about young people and whether they exercise their right to vote or get engaged in communities, um, I wanted to introduce a uh, um, uh, person who is representing the Perrin Family Foundation. Stand up, Laura, please. Um, this foundation is really focused on getting young people involved in leadership. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Perrin Family Foundation is a Connecticut-based foundation. Uh, it's a, a grant-making foundation that supports uh, and partners with community-based organizations that are committed to uh, working with young people to challenge injustice as they see and define it in their community. Uh, primarily through youth-led social change efforts and organizing efforts, which, which we define as sort of the root causes, not just addressing sort of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and we believe that this is a, a critical approach um, and, a, and an essential strategy for building long-term civic engagement because it helps young people see that the personal is political. Um, I think often there have been great strides made in the state with civics education, but it's actually getting involved in a community change effort that helps young people translate sort of democratic processes that happen up here into the state house into um, real life issues and, 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 and challenges so that a young person sees that what happens when they walk out their door, what happens when they walk around their neighborhood, what happens when they show up in their school building is in fact policy and politics mm -hmm. at play. Mm -hmm. uh, and un unfortunately, all too often, young people don't have um, uh, the opportunities in school for that kind of critical examination um, and are, are lacking sort of the opportunity structures mm -hmm. necessary mm -hmm. to plug into that kind of work. 
Thank you. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, Secretary of the State, I wanted to, to let you have an opportunity to talk about what you've been doing to get civics education back in our schools. That's been very important to you, and you now have a new program now to kind of recognize uh, civics programs in the schools. Back to what Alma said about building habits. You know, in the 1950s, when I was going to grammar school, um, we were taught how to be citizens. It was part of the curriculum. Uh, and also, I think our generation of parents would consider voting and those sorts of behaviors a duty. I mean, it was not okay to say, oh, I guess I won't vote today uh, because I don't have time, for example. You hear that a lot today. Well, you know, maybe I'll get around to it. So, so we've fallen very far behind in the notion of teaching what it even means to be a citizen. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I happen to think it's because it's not on the test, which it isn't. Uh, what's on the test is reading and writing and skills. So, um, and I think it was Jefferson who said that the primary reason we educate is to create citizens. And so we've sort of lost sight of that, I believe. We are trying to do something about it. It is sneaking back into the curriculum. It's a national level issue and has been uh, discussed a lot nationally by the National uh, Conference on Social Studies and other groups. And so I think it is coming, making a comeback. Uh, we're, we're hoping to do in our way here in Connecticut, uh, the Commissioner of Education, D Diana Wenzel, and I have just launched a new program we're trying to do exactly what, uh, is it Laura, just described, mm -hmm. which is make civics more than just uh, bills hopping through the boxes, that sort of thing, that bored us all to tears in, in high school uh, years ago, but more of a living experiential kind of learning where you're taking on a project perhaps in your town. And, and I'd like to actually introduce um, Steve Armstrong because he's oh, been working on, great. Uh, as a consultant to the State Department of Education, working on civics curriculum. And, and Steve, one of the things that you think is really important was mentioned by Denise and was also mentioned uh, by Laura, was, which is hands-on experience. Absolutely. Um, I agree with, by the way, there's kids in Connecticut that are fantastically jacked by this election season. I mean, I was at a high school last week where three 15-year-old girls were incredulous that I wouldn't tell them that I'm for Bernie Sanders 100 percent. And they gave this was this went on for 45 minutes. Well, so I mean, this was so these girls knew what they were talking about. But on the other hand, at the same school, I went to a social studies class. Well, let me just tell you, the quiz for the day. This was a civics class was the departments of the federal government, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, and who the secretaries were for each department. That was the quiz for the day. And I, I can assure you that the kids weren't jumping up and down with excitement as they were answering those quizzes. So your point, Diane, is what we have new social studies frameworks, and we think that civics has to be more than just, I think a problem that we've had, that's, and I put myself right in that category as a civics teacher, is if we think if we just teach kids more facts about government, that that will create citizens. If we just told them more about how a bill becomes a law, that somehow, somehow, what we think is really that we want kids to be, that schools should be places where kids practice citizenship that we give kids as many opportunities as we can. And this could start in the first grade. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't the, isn't the teacher and the kids who sit down after a week of school and make the class rules for the year, isn't that at some level civic efficacy? So we start there. We want kids to be engaged in community projects. It's got to be more than just learning about it. We think it's schools have to be places where kids practice it. Thank you, Steve. Um, Eric, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak again, but I'll, I'll let Bilal comment. Go ahead. Just very quickly, yeah. while on the one hand, I think certainly um, civics education is a key piece of what needs to happen, but when I think about young people, and there are various communities, different communities of young people that we could you know, certainly talk about from folks who are in college to people who are living in cities like Hartford or Bridgeport or New Haven. And I think the, the piece you raised earlier about the issues and the things that they care about become vitally important. If you're a young African American in a city like Hartford, you're unemployed, you see government dysfunctioning, dysfunctional, not responding to your needs and interests. 
um, the idea that you will be engaged in the political system, um, you know, especially beyond voting, um, I think becomes even more and more remote, regardless of how much civic education you've received. And so I think that's another piece of this as well in terms of how we speak to young people, how we respond to the kinds of needs and interests that they have, and whether our elected officials are really being responsive and we're really focused on doing that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is important that also came out, I cast my first vote in 1984. And I loved it because one of the things that they did in terms of making it convenient for me is at the age of 17, my birthday was in October, so I would be 18 before the presidential election, so I was able to participate mm -hmm. in the primary. That was the first vote mm -hmm. I cast. Not every state does that, so making it more convenient for young people. Although we do that in Connecticut right. now, thanks to uh, But many Merrill. states don't do it. The other thing that happened was when I cast my first ballot, I got up out of my dorm bed, I walked over to the uh, Union Hall, and the voting place was on campus. I'm at the University of Hartford. Students need to figure out if their dorm is in Hartford or if their dorm is in West Hartford. And then they have to hop on a bus and ride to a polling place someplace else, and that's got to be organized. And so we also need to do things to make it more convenient for young people to become involved. Student IDs should count at a college campus as much as a gun permit counts for identifying you as a citizen who's eligible to vote. And we have states that obviously will let a gun permit allow you to vote, but the student ID from a state issue institution is not good enough. And students generally don't have driver's license and they rely on that ID for primarily everything. And so making it more convenient I think is a key piece, but also responding to the needs and the interests, especially a disaffected youth in places like Hartford, places like Bridgeport, places like Waterbury, that's also a key piece of this as well. Agreed. Um, Eric, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak again, but first I, I wanted to say that um, as uh, Steve Armstrong was talking about civics, I thought about something that you write in your book about how civics, even the word sounds boring. Civics, ugh. <laughs> I'll let you pick it up from there. <laughs> um, and I I'll just rise again here, because uh, th this is one of these little interludes of uh, th these 10-minute mini uh, Sermons. I don't know what, what, what uh, uh, but 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 I, I will try to be, be as inclusive as possible here in the conversation. Um, a, a couple things here, actually, just on that last point that Diane made. Um, there's no question that civics is highly unsexy uh, to most people generally, and to most young people certainly, right? Um, and I think one of the fundamental ways that we can make it actually sexy uh, is to talk about the thing that has kind of been an undercurrent in a lot of our conversation thus far today, actually just in these last comments that Bill all made, um, which is to make it explicitly and unabashedly about power. We're talking about power here, right? And a lot of times when you get to, you know, nonpartisan gatherings to talk about citizenship, um, putting the word power uh, on the table can feel a little bit like, ooh, this could be a little hot, or this is a little dangerous, or you know, there's something inherently unseemly about power. The very topic of power is kind of, you know, every word association we have with it, power mad, power hungry, people going on a power trip. You know, it's not a positive emotional association we have with talk about power. Uh, and yet, if we're being candid about what we are doing together, what the people who built this place were doing when they built this place, uh, they are trying to figure out, we are trying to figure out together who gets what and why. Who has voice and why? Who gets included and why? And who doesn't and why not? Right? And these are questions inherently of power. And I think the more comfortable we are naming power, breaking it down, anatomizing it, describing the ways in which power operates, the sources of power in civic life, whether it's money power, people power, ideas power, social norms power, all of these, state power, all these different forms of power require, you know, literacy and power. Now, I can get excited about that if I'm, you know, someone who's not currently excited about politics. Uh, you know, I, I could be a, someone who watches Game of Thrones is excited about literacy and power, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, they, they get it intuitively, right? Uh, but I think making our, the way that we both talk about uh, and teach civics uh, more explicitly about power is important, but you know, to Steve's point and to the point that we've actually been hearing throughout here, um, and action, practice, is what matters so fundamentally. Um, you know, 
th there is actually a movement afoot in the United States, um, uh, starting uh, in part with a group in Chicago called the Mikvah Challenge, um, named after a fellow named Abner Mikvah, uh, who was a United States congressman and then later a federal judge and later a White House counsel, who in his retirement, feeling the same things that we all feel here today about the the, the dissolution of civic education in the schools asked the same question that Stephen and others have asked, which is, why? Maybe because the same old method of pounding facts into people's heads isn't going to work, and instead really trying to cultivate uh, as a matter of challenge to educators and students alike, learn by doing, right? And so the Mikvah Challenge runs all of these programs in Chicago public schools and now in L.A. and a few other cities around the United States where young people learn civics by doing. They, they, they figure out why it is that in their neighborhood the park uh, isn't kept up. They figure out why it is in their neighborhood garbage pickup is always half a day late. They figure out, in their, you know, and they begin to kind of see, and once you start having that lens of looking around your community, your community in which you appear to be economically and politically disenfranchised, a community in which maybe there isn't a lot of opportunity, and you begin asking why, and you begin asking who decided that, who decided that? Uh, and then you begin to actually unravel the way that, you know, programs from kid governor all the way up, you begin to unravel the systems that led to the fact that your garbage is always late, pickup is late. You uh, begin to read the systems that lead to the fact that your water quality hasn't been tested in a lot longer than the water quality, you know, a mile away over here in the nicer neighborhood, right? You begin to understand that these things didn't just happen to us. They happened as a result of a whole set of interlocking systems that we can become literate in. And if we read these systems and understand these systems, then we actually begin to know how to exercise power. Right? That's what these students are doing in Chicago. And there's, there's a, a New England counterpart to that called Generation Citizen, operating out of Providence, uh, Rhode Island. Same method, same approach. And it's called Action Civics. That simple, right? Action Civics. And you, you learn by doing in this way. And I think that is so fundamental to what we're talking about. And it's true, again, not only for young people, but for all of us, quote, unquote, experienced grown-ups, too. Right? We learn by doing. We learn by showing up and deciding how we're going to actually solve this, resolve this dispute or solve this problem at the level of the neighborhood. I quite agree with Suzanne that, you know, and this is actually a very interesting moment in our country. In a cross-partisan, cross-ideological way, people are seeing the benefits and the virtues of relocalization of politics and of citizenship. Um, and cities, in particular, are the engines of uh, civic innovation right now. The city that I'm from, Seattle, uh, you know, we're leading on $15 minimum wage. We're leading on paid sick leave. We're leading, and we're not doing it in isolation. We're doing it in what I call networked localism. We are webbing up with other cities and other citizens and activists in other cities who are trying to do the same thing. And, come in, and we're trading playbooks, and we're learning from one another, and we're sharing and building resource together. And this web of cities acting where states and the federal government can't or won't, um, on pick your issue, on guns, on wage, on public health, uh, you know, this is where a lot of our civic progress is going to happen. And so whatever your feelings and opinions are on $15 or, um, you know, uh, gun regulation, whatever it might be, the fact is that the local... Uh, is, is such a great arena for us, the grown-ups, also to practice. And, you know, the, the, the beat that Martha had asked me to kind of speak to in this, in this second little mini-sermon, what have you, is, is, um, is something I want to weave in right now, which is this notion that when we, are, when we see each other properly as, again, not cogs in a machine, but as parts of a living organism, as nodes in a network, we're all on the network, right? And on the network, what happens? Contagion happens. Contagion happens. And that's not just because of social media and new technologies that literally make things contagious in a you know, meet social media viral way. Um, but you know, there have been fascinating studies over the last few years about complex social networks that show that all manner of social behaviors, good and bad, are incredibly contagious. So or social situations. So uh, obesity, proclivity to smoke, uh, proclivity for depression, uh, likelihood of participation in things like voting, um, all of these things 
all of these characteristics that we think of as, this is me, this is my life. Either I'm, I need to lose weight, or I need to do this, or I need to go vote. No, it's not just you. You don't live in a little atomistic bubble. You are, by your actions and omissions, continuously setting off cascades of contagion. And these studies are showing in fascinating ways. Some of you may have heard of the, these Framingham, Massachusetts studies uh, that, that show that friends of, friend, friends of your friends uh, uh, are some of the most influential nodes in networks, that the kind of two degrees of separation away, uh, if, if a friend of your friend uh, is obese, you are more likely to be obese than if your friend of a friend is not, right? Uh, and so you don't even have to see or know the ways in which uh, that contagion is happening. But when people zoom out and look at this in a big picture way, you realize that all of these things, showing up as a citizen, not showing up as a citizen, being kind, not being kind, being courteous, being discourteous, being civil in our public life or being uncivil, these things are incredibly rapidly contagious, right? And I think th this is an analog to the idea that we are in a garden, we are in this living body. It is a recognition that with that, when you realize this, and you realize it kind of from the, you know, there's some people here I, I think have some as to the public health world. All I'm talking about here is something that anybody who's ever worked in public health knows cold, right? And what we have to do as citizens is to begin to think and see the world as if we were all epidemiologists, right? But instead of looking at the map of our community and asking, uh-oh, where's the flu outbreak? What are the nodes? What are the schools? What are the households where flu or gun violence or HIV or all these bad things are happening? We have to look at where are the nodes where good things are happening? Where are the nodes where volunteerism is happening? Where are the nodes where people are deciding to influence others to show up and participate? What are the no where, where are those nodes? How can we amplify and accelerate those, right? Um, and just as public health uh, people do, we have to be reading systems like that, reading those kinds of networks and understanding that they are not fixed just because you take a snapshot in this year's Civic Health Index report. doesn't say a darn thing about what next year's is going to be. Right? Because it just might be, starting tonight at this town hall, that we set off a contagion on something, on participation, on volunteerism. And it may be that we move the dial over the course of a year in the state of Connecticut. Right? And you can think and you can laugh at that and smile, oh, that's a cute, you know, na naive little thought. No, that's literally how anything has ever happened in this country. A room of about this size, less than 100 people, decided they're going to behave in a certain way and change norms, change ideas, change attitudes, change the storylines that people have in their heads, and that change cascades out in a contagion. And I think that's a real measure of our power as citizens. Uh, and so power, both in the sense of being willing to candidly name the inequities of race and class and gender and other things that divide us and that concentrate opportunity and deconcentrate de opportunity, but also power in the sense of recognizing that each one of us can actually set off one of these pro-social or anti-social contagions. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Professor Brown? I had a couple of thoughts. One on contagion. This may not be distinctive of the University of Connecticut, but we have a contagion of opening the door and holding the door for each other. And I've always found that rather remarkable. It's just all over the campus, always happens. It's just a nice thing. There are other problems, but that's one of the very nice things. <laughs> now, uh, I thought you were going to talk about the contagion of husky fever. <laughs> that's what came to my mind. That's another nice thing. Uh, nice thing for the citizens of the state and support for the university. Uh, Eric mentioned power, and I was wondering how many of us here would regard Black Lives Matter as uh, an indicator of civic health. I personally would regard it as a wonderful uh, indicator of civic health. But it also comes back to the power uh, question that uh, Eric mentioned, which makes people uncomfortable and, and pits one interest against another interest, which is where conflict comes from, and most of us don't really like conflict all that much. Uh, so I think that when we think about civic engagement, it's important for us uh, to not think about motherhood and apple pie things just, like voting and 
joining a club and playing softball or bowling with some other people. But to realize that, you know, it's really ultimately about power and people recognizing that if they will use their power, they will have it. And that's one of the things that happened with young people in the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. It's happened again in this present uh, election season. Uh, and I think Black Lives Matter is a wonderful example of this kind of uh, coalescence and uh, uh, civic consciousness. Thank you, Professor. Um, we did want to talk a little bit about trust. One of the things that you talk about, Eric, a lot is trust and that uh, people, in order to engage civically, have to start building trust and have to rely on that. And so this is a snapshot in Connecticut of um, how people feel in terms of having confidence in corporations, in media, and in their public schools. We're very high in our public schools, and that puts us 13th in the ranking of states. Media, we're 12th in the ranking of states. And in corporations, we're about 36th. So what does that mean and what does that tell us? Um, I want to start by talking a little bit um, to Brian Flaherty here. Brian has an interesting perspective because he was uh, both an elected official um, uh, serving the state legislature and now is working for CBIA. And I wonder how you translate that confidence that people have in corporations into what corporations are doing to try to encourage citizenship. Well, you know, we just, CBIA, we've got uh, thousands of members and we have a workforce that works for them of hundreds of thousands of men and women. And, and it was interesting to read those indicators of trust because if you, do you trust a corporation, yes or no, most people may have an image of what a corporation is and what they do and what they don't do. We did a survey a year ago with Liberty Bank of our members and corporations on corporate giving and I know it's a trap sometimes to think corporate giving equals citizenship right. because it's broader than that. Uh, and we did find that you know, 85% of the people responded that they donate, corporations donate money. More importantly, they encourage volunteerism. Mm -hmm. That those, such as the Campbell Soup Company, which is in Norwalk and also Pepperidge Farm, mm -hmm. uh, up, up in Bloomfield, they donate their products. Mm -hmm. They donate their expertise. And, uh, and when they create that culture uh, within the companies that some call creating shared value, mm -hmm they realize that, that they have a role, especially, and it's been talked about here, if it's local, mm -hmm. if it's felt locally, mm -hmm. if the, the community gardens that are surround us here at the old state house that the Aetna and other companies uh, contribute to, can that be seen and felt in this community? And I think that's the key, because they start off with the jobs that keep Connecticut working, mm -hmm. and then the impact of those jobs. And it's been fascinating just to, to listen to the conversation now, because the way that we learn as a society, the way and where we work and how we interact with each other is really changing. And, and there's an onus on corporations, obviously, to keep up with that, mm -hmm. but also to find ways to make sure that we are plugged in, that we, for example, we spend a great deal of time at CBIA going to see our members because they want to meet their elected officials. The elected officials, of course, are knocking on the door. Denise, you remember, knock on the door and uh, uh, tour and meet your constituents. It's all people powered. And that's one of the, I think, the biggest positive signs coming ahead. This is the birthplace of Yankee ingenuity. There's no way we can't find a way to adapt uh, and do it together. I was interested the other day in hearing about how the Hartford uh, incentivizes employees to volunteer. They actually give them points toward paying for their health insurance for every hour that they volunteer. I thought that was sort of a unique uh, prospect. Yeah, Campbell's and Nestle Waters, where I used to work, had they call them dollars for doers programs. And so that if you track your hours and, and you're with the United Way, the YMCA, any of these other groups, that those groups can also benefit uh, with some backing from the company. And again, it's all about it. It works best if, if it's locally. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Thanks, Brian. Um, we talked about uh, trust in media, and actually that trust in media in Connecticut is pretty high compared to probably what a lot of people would have thought it was because we're hearing about trashing of the media all the time. Carolyn Lumsden is here from the Hartford Current. She's the uh, opinion page uh, editor. And uh, Carolyn, what do you find in terms of how people respond to you? I know that the, the Current is always sort of a lightning rod for people. There are people who think it's this, people who think it's that. Um, but what do you see when you're, when you're getting the uh, responses to the opinion pages? Well, 
Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is a great panel. Thank you all very much. Glad to have you. And um, actually, we, I like to think of uh, our pages, the opinion pages, as sort of a community garden in which we invite everyone, Denise, to your point, to come and plant your seeds of ideas there. Uh, and I was uh, happy to see that we have as much trust and engagement as, your sur as the survey says. Thanks. Um, I think that our pages serve as a great forum for the community to come out. And actually, there's no greater power than seeing your name in print mm -hmm. and online and knowing that uh, your letter to the editor is being read in the Capitol. So um, we have reached, worked very hard to try to open our pages to um, a range of voices uh, to people of color, to women, to young people. We have a special, uh, every Wednesday we have a special feature for younger voices. Um, we do also things with you, CTN, thank you very much to kind of increase civic engagement. We have our debates, political debates. We do endorsement interviews with candidates. But I really think um, our greatest uh, place of engagement is in the letters to the editor and the op-eds. Oh, by the way, our op-eds have been the number one most read feature thing in the entire newspaper online of anything that is read for the last two years. Really? Yeah. Very interesting. Well, it must mean you're doing a good job. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions or comments they want to make? I haven't called upon uh, any of you to just step up. So if anybody wants to say something, wants to comment, wants to ask a question, please raise your hands, and we'll get to you with a microphone. And if you're being shy, then I'm going to go to the next person. We have somebody over here. Okay, let me, uh, why don't you go around, Brendan? You can get to the mic better, probably. Oh, uh, my name is Sharik. I live in Hartford. In the last mayoral election, Hartford participation was 18%. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do we? I mean, we know the roles in the city. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the voters' roles in cities and towns. Have any research has ever been done to um, to send them a letter, ask them how come they haven't voted? You know, you know what I mean? I mean, 18% is pretty pathetic. Very low, you know. I mean, like yeah. it's unbelievable. So. Yeah, Denise, what are we trying to do Thank to get you. better turnout? I feel like I've spent my life trying to figure that out. <laughs> and, I, and I do ask lots of people in lots of different ways. And mostly, I think, I've come to the conclusion that many, many people who live in places like Hartford, by the way, I live in Hartford, um, haven't had as great an experience with government as I have and people like me. And I think that kind of goes for young people, too, to some degree. And so naturally, that's not the first place they turn to get anything done or to think that it has anything to do with their lives. I think it's what Bilal was saying. You know, they just don't think it makes any difference. Mm -hmm. And every time you ask someone, they'll say, M but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. My vote doesn't matter. And that is our greatest challenge, is to make them understand that it does. Mm -hmm. It really does. I believe that, but I don't think they do. So. I and I don't know how to overcome that exactly. There are some tremendous programs I have seen that are making a difference. I can think of one, uh, the Parent Leadership Training Institute, um, which basically it's a program that takes mostly low-income women, mostly, who have children. And what you find is they deeply care about the future of their children. I don't care who they are. They're very in interested. But they have no idea how to access power as we were talking about. So what this program does is literally teach them. It, it, it takes in uh, groups of uh, parents and says, if, you know, they care about their children and they have training sessions and they teach them about how to contact an official to get something done. It teaches them to even figure out what they can get done. And I saw one group of parents in Waterbury, for example, where the parents were very concerned about the condition of the middle school. They wanted a new school for their kids. They had no idea how to go about doing that. And after they took this training program, they got their middle school because they understood you know, that, that the Board of Education is the governing body and that you go as a group to a town, town council meeting and, and you go in and you make yourselves known and you vote 
And if you let them know you vote, that makes a difference. And I saw it work. Uh, so and, there and are you know, programs Denise, you like made that. a comment about relationship with government that made me think of something that Alma has said, which is that when you're thinking about Latinos, you can't think of them as one big block, that we have people who are born here who are Latino, we have people who um, are, you know, come from Puerto Rico to come live in Hartford or in Bridgeport or whatever, um, and then we have people who are immigrants from lots of different countries, some of them where they have experienced repressive regimes, right, Alma? And so maybe they're not so comfortable Right, they're not voting. so comfortable, and you have to, I think what, um, she's, what, what uh, Denise is saying is true. I actually did a a, uh, a workshop for PLTI on how government works. So I think it is important that we teach people how government works and how it affects you. Um, and making things easier, as you were saying. Um, for instance, if you have to vote and it's a state election, you vote in one place. But if it's a, a local election, you have to vote somewhere else. So then it gets confusing. Okay, where, do, where exactly do I vote? Um, in Puerto Rico, you vote once every four years for everything. Here, you're voting like every six months. It seems to be an election. Yeah. After a while, yeah. you know, people people will say to me, "But I already voted. Yeah. Why am I going to again?" Yeah. You know. So I think it's those kind of things. I think that um, the system, the way it is, is it's uh, uh, purposely confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it could be a lot simpler. Yeah. And, oh, we and, have Richard and it, I think it's, here. It's sim if it was more simple. Mm -hmm easier to explain, mm -hmm. you may be able to get more people mm -hmm. to eat. Yeah, I think um, Lourdes Montavo is here, and she uh, works for the Secretary of State, and you told me a story a long time ago that I couldn't believe, that there are people who live in Hartford, and they fly home to Puerto Rico yes. to vote, because yes. they don't realize they can vote here, they think they have to go to Puerto Rico, which just kind of blew my mind. Um, Richard, you um, are part of the Civic Health Advisory Group, and you've also been involved in a project to really get turn out the vote. Tell us what you did, and how did it work out? Did it make a difference? It did make a difference. Um, I'm uh, connected with something called the Hartford Votes, Hartford Vota Coalition, which is a coalition of uh, 12 or 13 organizations and agencies devoted to increasing voter um, engagement and voter turnout in Hartford. And um, we, of course, uh, were concerned at seeing voter turnout rates such as 18%, the gentleman over here quoted. and. Um, we sort of were wringing our hands, thinking, well, what do we do? How do you get people to vote? We came across a project that, uh, was, uh, that took place in Detroit, where a group of organizations similar to our coalition um, got out in the streets and talked to people. They did door-to-door -door canvassing, and they uh, gathered statistics and analyzed statistics, and what they found was uh, when they went out and talked with people, more people voted. And if they talked with people twice, even more people voted. If they talked with people three times, even more people voted. So we replicated that project. It really gets back to the, the, the concept of people have to be invited, mm -hmm. uh, the, the power of relationships, talking with people face to face, which is not to say there isn't a place for social media and, and such things. Mm -hmm. But uh, So we did a kind of a pilot project in Hartford with the same methodology, and what we found was that there was an 8 to 10% uh, higher voter turnout rate in the areas where we canvass than in other areas. Mm -hmm. So um, if you were able to do that over a period of years, you can make an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Eric, it strikes me also that there's something of a contagion there. When Richard said, when we talked to people, then there were more, and then there were more, and then there were more. Not only the idea of inviting them in, but the behavior that's that's mimicked isn't really the word I want, but that's imitated by other people. That, that's right, and, and you know, the question of, did you want to add something on this? The, the, the thing that I, you know, that drives that contagion, though, uh, something that we keep talking about here, and we can't name it enough, motivation. What's, what's my motivation, right? Uh, and sometimes it will be enough motivation that, you know, a horrible candidate will get elected if I don't vote, so I'd better do that because bad things could happen. Uh, but other times there will be motivations that are much more tangibly about kind of, you know, my, my family's needs or wants, right? And so... Um, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was saying to some folks over dinner, I was uh, out in Kansas City uh, for a convening that was put together by this really wide coalition of faith leaders, community leaders from um, the, the, the poorest, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, because of this correlation, uh, the, 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 the least white uh, neighborhoods 
uh, in Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and what the summit was about was, it was called the Moral Economy Summit. Moral Economy, right? And uh, again, what they were fighting on in particular, in, well, in general was the idea um, that we need, an, that economies don't just fall from the sky. Economies are arrangements that we agree upon, right? How we decide to allocate things, how we decide what's fair. Uh, and what they were saying fundamentally to poor people and people of color in Kansas City was you get to be part of this decision of what is a fair economy. And not in general, but in particular around the question that they focused on there uh, on payday lending, on predatory lending, right? Uh, and, and I'm sure in this state too, but you know, in, in that state as well, you know, th there are so many poor communities that are literally preyed upon by uh, the, these financial service providers, and the idea that this is just the way it is is not enough, right? There, there was motivation now among these communities to say, you know what, it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, it ought to change. Uh, I don't know how to make that change. I don't know the first thing about who makes those rules, but we're going to get motivated to start organizing some of our neighbors. We're going to start organizing some of our congregation. We're going to link up with some other congregations. And all of a sudden, you have hundreds of people organizing in a way that brings pressure to bear on the legislature, on federal regulators. And you know, this is an age of bottom-up power. I agree completely that Black Lives Matter is a sign of health. Um, we have a system that is ill. And when you have a system that is ill and you have movements arising, uh, you know, and, and that's true of the Sanders movement. It's true, frankly, of the Trump movement. Uh, they, 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 are, they are, you know, I'd rather have Trump supporters out there saying what they're saying than simply saying, I give up on the whole thing. I'm just going to stay home. I'm not going to say a thing. I'm not going to show up for anything. They are expressing their anger in a way that says, I still actually believe this thing can be changed. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, a, that's something to work with. And Eric, you just made me feel pretty good about Donald Trump's <laughs> campaign. I'm feeling much more optimistic now. Thank you. Oh, we have a comment from uh, one of our audience members here. Tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Leslie Carlson. I'm a, I'm a resident of Meriden, Connecticut, and I have to say I am proud of my city. I, a few weeks ago, I was list I'm the person that walks, listens, and hears the general public. I am not a part of an organization. I am me. I am a loving person with a very good heart, and I see people for who they are in, on an individual basis as they talk to me. Um, I've heard a lot of complaints amongst our city members, and I decided to take a proactive step in making a walk towards violence. As I was developing that walk, which I did in two weeks' time, I was criticized, verbally abused. It was amazing the things that people were saying to me to try to stop what I was doing. I found strength in their negativity, and that's pushing me forward to want to do more. And the thing is, what really bothers me right now in our time is what they call the me generation. I do speak to high school. My, my porch is a open forum for anybody who stops by my house, which is all the time. And I do constantly hear about what they call the privileged. Our, our teenagers, our youth feel that we all owe them something instead of you have to work for what you get and be responsible for yourself. We are all neighbors. That's how I see each and every one of you here. You're my neighbors, and I am proud to be standing by you. But what can we do about this generation who feels that we as adults owe them something when they have not done any community service, any organization, nothing? How can we go about that so we can get a better response to have them involved? I think I may have somebody here who may have a suggestion on that. Uh, ben Willis is with the Civic Life Project. I'm just thumbnail. Describe to people who don't know it what you do. Okay, so the Civic Life Project, um, I'll try and be quick. We're an organization that saw a problem that we're talking about now, and that was that um, how do we get young people to want to be engaged, just to what was just said, um, and actually participate in our system. Um, most young people see what happens on this national, local, and state level as things that don't affect them, don't affect their regular lives. And so we wanted to make them into engaged citizens and somehow make them vote, 
and then make them be able to carry on constructive dialogue around civics. So what we decided, the fun thing to do, the way to make civics, as Eric said, it's not sexy, the way to make it sexy would be to do it through filmmaking. So what our organization does is we bring in journalists, we bring in filmmakers, they go into classrooms and we ask kids, what makes you angry? And you know, most times it starts with like school lunch, right? It starts out, you know? But with school lunch, we can say, okay, so why did your school lunch change? We start talking about the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. We start talking about how the school comes up with its own policies, how they buy food, how this all happens. And so everything that makes a kid angry, in some way we turn into a, a civics question, the kids then figure out who they're gonna talk to in their community. They've interviewed Denise Merrill, they've interviewed a, a plenty of folks uh, around here, and they've interviewed, interviewed the governor, the lieutenant governor. So they, they research these people, they develop questions, and they go out. And the next step in that process is they finish making these films, and they show them to their communities. And what's amazing is that, you know, the kids start with a very sort of uh, focused idea. You know, maybe, yeah, when you're young, you're, you're selfish, and you're, maybe, maybe that's, that's true. I don't necessarily agree with that, but that could be the case. And they sort of have their one point of view and they're set in that way. You know, we had kids last year make a film on mistrust of the police. They were really angry at the police. But over the course of going out in their community and seeing civics from the perspective of you can see a problem in your community and you have the power to go out and have an impact on it just by talking about it, just by raising awareness about it, and then start seeing other people's points of view on it and realizing that someone you may have disagreed with Maybe they don't have such a, a bad point of view. Um, the, the film they made on the police, not to go on too long, they, um, these group of kids, they were inner city kids from Norwalk, Bridgeport, Stanford, they made a film about mistrust of the police, why they didn't trust the police. So I brought in police officers into the school. The kids interviewed these police officers. They made a film. They started to see things from the police's perspective. And now the kids go around with the police, and they go to elementary schools around the state. They show the film, and they do a panel discussion with the police, with the, the, my former students, and elementary school kids, and talk about, why there are trust issues with the police and what we can do to overcome it. So in that way, we're doing our little bit to try and help students be more engaged and maybe grow into uh, engaged citizens. Tell us where we can go uh, to watch their films. CivicLifeProject.org. And I've watched a number of them. They're terrific. Um, I want to have one of our teenagers join us here. Angela, Angelica, stand up, please. Um, Angelica is a student um, at Granby High School. East Granby High School, excuse me, East Granby High School. We, we're very particular about our towns and villages here in the state. Um, and she's part of the Connecticut Youth Forum and also was involved in a really interesting project uh, some time ago called Talk Text Act. Tell us about that. Oh, okay, so this, that just like got me so passionate because when I heard what she said, I forgot her name, but that people, teens today feel privilege that the adults owe them something. The youth forum is over 200 people that come and we're flexible and we talk about different topics and we all have the same basis at the end of the day. We have to work to change. Whatever we want, we have to go out and get it, but we have to do it together as a community. And Talk Text Act um, was a great starting point for something that is not discussed in schools anymore, which is mental health. Uh, it's discussed in health class, maybe for a few minutes, and then we keep going, take a mini quiz, and that's it. Uh, we got together during Youth Forum. The Leadership Network did it first, so we got trained on how to facilitate the conversation, and really those questions that were given to us through the phone after we answered, it would give us facts back. And we just use that as, as a template, because once you have a template, you could jump deeper into the conversation, and we just showed the Youth Forum what's out there, what's really going on, what's the reality instead of sugarcoating stuff that we see today through the media because it's just little light work. We jump into it and we're ready to hear the truth. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, that strikes me as exactly what we've been talking about. It's such a great case of what we've been talking about. And I think, you know, uh, Angelica? Angelica, yeah. yes. Angel you know, uh, th th there are two things I would say uh, uh, about this thread. Uh, number one, generationally, um, uh, I, I don't know that it's necessarily, uh, on the one hand, yes, you, when you're young, you may be somewhat more self-absorbed uh, uh, only because you haven't yet uh, arrived in, uh, to the web of fuller uh, responsibilities that you might as a parent or uh, other things. Uh, but I actually think uh, uh, in the broad scheme of things, you know, uh, today's millennials and post-millennials are... Uh, the most diverse generation in American history, the most networked generation in American history, uh, and the most intuitively fluent in how to make change in a sideways, horizontal way like Angelica's just describing, right? 
uh, and, and tolerant generation, right? Uh, I, I look at this generation and I think there's just, and I hear Angelica, and I think there's incredible asset and opportunity here, right? And the way that this generation is going to make change in civic life um, is going to look very different. I mean, not just because tools like Talk Text Act and projects like that wouldn't have existed a while ago, but because there's something really um, in the mindset um, uh, of young people that I think is, is different and exciting right now. And, I, you know, um, this is, uh, it's to me uh, an exciting thing. I want to introduce uh, David Ryan Polgar. He is um, an expert in tech ethics and digital citizenship. And so as we're talking about millennials and being a very connected generation, what is it that you're trying to get across to them about being an online user versus being an online citizen? Well, it's very analogous to everything we're talking about today. We need to be educated, empowered, and engaged. The web is only as good as we are, similar to your, your community. Right, we need to be empowered to actually care about what's going on around us, to be cognizant of other people, to be actively involved, to not just be a bystander, right, to be, but to be an upstander, right, to, to, to have empathy, to have kindness online. Okay, so um, I'm on Facebook, and I get uh, asked about 20 times a day to sign a petition, and I do that. Doesn't that make me a good citizen? I'm, on, I'm one of 400,000 people that wants to see more bunny rabbits on video. Well, the good, thing is, the, the good thing about online, we have to think about Facebook, right? The average American now spends 50 minutes a day on, on Facebook, so incredible opportunities to not only sign something, to do this passive form of activism, this hacktivism, but to actually go on and maybe crowdfund. We've seen Kickstarter campaigns that really have raised local, uh, local campaigns. So that's what we really need to think about. We can't talk about civic engagement as an offline activity because online is such an important aspect. And that's what we're doing at, at an organization I run called the Digital Citizenship Summit. Right? We're bringing together all different stakeholders, parents, educators, community leaders, industry to, to talk about what safe, savvy, and ethical use of technology is and to bring together people to actually be the digital change, to be more active about it. I liked what you said about um, being passive, mm -hmm. uh, signing those petitions. That's not really all there is, you know, and I think a lot of people think, oh, well, I did that, so I'm involved, you know, right? Right. Well, the good thing is the online can lead to offline. We talk about contagion. Well, what's contagious? Something goes viral online, right? So when we're voting for this upcoming election, I'm looking at my Facebook feed and I'm seeing all the people who voted. We know what you see online impacts our actual physical behavior, and that's, that's what we can do. Great. Let's try to get more contagion on that and less on the uh, Star Wars mask. Okay. <laughs> um, Brian is a millennial also. Uh, Brian was the, uh, speaking of Meriden, your wonderful city, Brian was the youngest ever president of Kiwanis. And it strikes me that a lot of millennials have not been joining traditional organizations like that. What happens when they don't? Do those organizations, do they merge into something else? Do they go out of business and something takes their place or what? Well, I think things are changing. Um, I know with Michael Wannis Club, we've attracted more millennials based on how we're approaching what we do in the community. But I think a lot of the traditional clubs are changing their models, or at least need to change their models. Uh, millennials are looking for both the invitation, as we've heard, but also a way to see their impact. You know, we are one of the most network generations. We've got the connections. We want to see what we're doing mm -hmm. having an impact. And I think the other thing that I wanted to comment on was what some of the barriers are to millennials, and I can't claim the idea. I heard this at a program at the Stowe Center last week that the largest barrier to millennials being active is debt and college loans. And millennials are so focused on, you know, what's my next job going to be? Where's my paycheck going to come from? There's no time to think about how can I be involved. Mm -hmm. And the speaker, uh, Andrew Aiden, who co-wrote March with Congressman John Larson, talked about how we are just as networked as those who started the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have the tools, it's all there, it's just we have so much more debt <laughs> and other things to focus on that if that were taken away, we could accomplish so much more. Mm -hmm. It's kind of horrendous to think that um, school debt, thank you, Brian, uh, would keep people from being involved, but I, I'm going to take your word for that. Bilal? I mean, these are very interesting and very important points, but I think also as we talk about these things and recognize the limitations and opportunities for engagement, to really keep also in mind, I think, what we talked about very early on around some of the issues around class and race. So even when we talk about millennials, we talk as if this is a monolithic group. 
Um, and the access to the technologies, the, ac the opportunities for engagement differs from community to community. I mean, even your point earlier about voter turnout at Hartford, and the Secretary of State can speak to this specifically, um, voter turnout generally drops from presidential to congressional to state to local. We know that um, in general, far less money is spent, a lot less attention, a lot less mobilization. I mean, there are a whole huge number of factors, but what we also know is that the drop off in Hartford isn't the same all across the state and that there are lots of communities in which turnout is much higher in which race and ethnicity and class play a role in affecting that outcome. And so as we sort of think about how we boost engagement, how we boost participation, we need to think about what are those agents of mobilization, for example, that actually get people out to vote. I mean, two particular mobilization agents that are much weaker than they used to be, labor unions and political parties, right? They historically have been at the center of mobilizing their people, especially at the local level, to get them involved. They're less they're less powerful today than they were in the past. And when it comes to those off-year elections, they spend a whole lot less money. This time around, we're going to see more money than we spent in 2012, which was more money than we spent in 2008, which was more money than we spent in 2004. I mean, you, you follow it, and we're talking in the billions. But when those off-year elections come, the investments drop down, the resources drop down, and we see what we see in places like Hartford and Bridgeport and Waterbury, but we don't see the same thing in Simsbury or Avon. We see a drop off, but not the same. So we've got to get out there and do more work like a lot of the people have talked about to turn people out, to get them engaged, to help them become involved and active in the political system. And voting, and the last thing, and I don't want to talk too long, the last thing is that we talk a lot about voting as a, and obviously as a central role in the democratic society. But the health of our democracy will depend on a lot more than just voting mm -hmm. and getting people engaged in a broad range of ways, attending those city council meetings, those school board meetings, participating on commissions and boards. I mean, there's a wide range of ways in which people can become involved. And even then, we've got to, to take note of the gender, the race, and the ethnic differences when it comes to engagement beyond voting mm -hmm. if we're really going to transform this democracy and make it be the healthy one that it ought to be. I think I saw a hand raised over here. Was there some? Yes. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> Thank you, Diane. My name is John Santa, and I am the chairman of Multi Justice Initiative. And I would like to make our colleagues aware of the fact that we have an uh, unspoken for immigrant population coming in about two, into our cities and towns, about 250 every week about 1,000 a month, about 12,000 a year. And these are people coming from a country called our prisons. And if anybody here is so naive as to think our prisons are not another country, you got, you got some lessons coming. They are another place. And the people that come back, we all understand they've transgressed the law. That's a given. Thank you very much. But also, they paid the price. So enough is enough. And when they are diminished, when they are demeaned, when they are marginalized, when they are not allowed to fully participate, our garden won't grow. Do the math simply, 12,000 a year, 35 years, that's almost a half a million people in this little state of Connecticut, this little country of America, we, where, where we drank the Kool-Aid of hyperincarceration, generally in America and specifically here in Connecticut, this is what we got. So we got half a million people here in Connecticut, and they want to be part of Connecticut too, and they deserve to be part of Connecticut too. And so, therefore, I think we ought to think about what are we doing to respond to that? What are we doing to make that a better thing? Because we, our garden won't grow unless one out of seven people can par participate. So, John, what do we do? Well, I think that what we need to do is to work with our, with our state legislature to make for policy and, and, uh, and practice that has better and more robust integration of people back in the society. We have to embrace simple things like the fact that 9 out of 10 people that go to prison are addicted and or mentally ill. So therefore, our prisons should not be towers of confinement and punishment, but rather towers of treatment, of mental health, treatment of addiction services. And when they come out, support them in the community to help them keep maintain their sobriety, maintain their sanity, and reintegrate. Because the fact of the matter is, when someone comes out of incarceration and becomes a full citizen, Everybody wins. And when they don't, guess Everybody what? Loses. 
Everybody loses. John, you're a retired um, owner of a, uh, an energy company. Um, what can companies do about that, and how are you trying to spread the word to reintegrate people? Because, let's face it, if people don't have a job, things are not going to go well after that. Well, what, what, our, what our organization is doing right now is we've, we've engaged the, uh, the Nielsen Harris Polling Company, and, uh, and we are about to conduct a survey of 1,000 Connecticut employers asking why they would or would not hire a formerly incarcerated person. We already know the predilection is not to. We got that. Mm -hmm. We wanted to find the paradigm and help and begin a dialogue, a rational dialogue, that, that transcends the paradigm of, I don't want to hire them. Mm -hmm. Why don't you want to hire them? What's that all about? Do you know what happens when you don't? What could be better? How could they better qualify themselves? And so that's, that's, the, uh, that's what we hope to do. And we're getting great support from Brian's group, CBIA, and from the Capital Regions Group, and from the uh, Fairfield County, uh, the Business Council of Fairfield County, and the uh, Chamber of Commerce. So it's, it's just starting right now, and those are our survey partners. And that's what we're trying to shift the paradigm, mm -hmm. bring about awareness so we can bring action, Motiva motivation action. And if people want to find out more about it, you can Google the Malta Justice Initiative, some very, very interesting things that they're doing. Alma? I just wanted to say that I want to piggyback on what you're saying because um, in Bridgeport, we do have an initiative that uh, one of your members is part of, which is the Reentry Collaborative in Bridgeport, which the BRBC is also a member of. And the, our mayor has taken a really deep interest in second chances as he calls it, and um, you're right, without being able to ban the box, mm -hmm. you know, making it, uh, making it mandatory, I think, if you want to do city projects that you work with contractors that are going to ban that box and give people What do you mean by ban the box? That what? you don't have to, um, when you first apply for mm -hmm. a job, say that you had been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You could do that maybe later in an interview. Mm -hmm. and, and for people who don't know, we should say that one of the reasons that the mayor is very interested in this is that the mayor, in fact, is getting his own second chance. He right. was incarcerated. He was incarcerated, so he understands how important this is. And I, to me, not only ban the box is important, but also those support systems, as you were saying, when um, re, you know, uh, returning citizens we're calling them come back into our communities. We're getting ready in Bridgeport. We already have, we already know that 1,048 people are coming up back to our community. So we're starting to get ready for that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is that um, tomorrow there's gonna be a press conference about um, a compact with employers, um, getting employers to actually promise that they're going to uh, give people who are coming back a chance to be employed um, in their companies. Brian, how's CBIA uh, supporting that initiative? Well, we are, uh, as John talked about, uh, trying to be one of several conveners. To, uh, we've got uh, people who are on our board and our members that are very hungry for a trained workforce mm -hmm. that uh, ha are very committed to these. some of these, they're called the second chance initiatives uh, that are critical, just as uh, working with a group called CT21 Connecticut uh, for the 21st century has also been very active on that in terms of long-term support services. Some of the other issues of how Connecticut's government works, how the services are provided, and unfortunately sometimes at the Capitol they look for short-term solutions. I was guilty of it when I was there, two-year election cycle, one-year budget. But what are the changes in policy? John spoke, I couldn't be any more passionate than you just were, or, or you, that could really make a change over time mm -hmm. to make it a better uh, state, to, to build a better state. And so we've got a lot of members, and there are, we're certainly not alone, uh, pitching in uh, from, the, from the private sector because these things can happen. They're important. I think that, you know, John, when you mentioned the number, thank you, Brian, the number of people that are coming out, uh, when, you, when you start talking about those numbers, it becomes pretty staggering if we don't do something. Um, you said five, 250 a week. Wow, interesting, interesting. Yes, Bilal? Do we have somebody over here who wanted to comment? Okay, uh, Marilyn Calderon is with, uh, speaking of power, Connecticut <laughs> parent power, uh, yeah. I think when it comes to second chance society, we have to definitely dig a little deeper as to why lives have been ravaged by misfortune in our state of Connecticut. I used to oversee the juvenile review board where we actually um, enabled families and young children that were being arrested at the age of eight 
believe it or not, and we were advocating to raise the age to 17 to ensure that young children were not treated and adjudicated for those reasons of possibly becoming more aggressive during the school day. So we adopted this balance and restorative justice model where children actually have the opportunity to be self-reflective and really look back at what they caused harm to and then take responsibility for their actions. And I think that the balance and restorative justice model kept the integrity of this child intact because not only was a parent in the room with them, but there was also community stakeholders that were part of the process. Connecticut Parent Power builds on the power of stories, engaging, educating, and mobilizing parents across the state to ensure that they are their child's first and most influential teacher. But let's face it, if parents have been ravaged by misfortune time and time again, how can they give their children a better chance if they don't know what they don't know? So it's up to us as advocates and leaders in our communities to change change that narrative to ensure that no child is ever left in that capacity. And most importantly, never feels as though they're alone. Latino, African American, Asian children, you name it, black and brown children, they don't want handouts. They want a chance, an equal, equitable chance. So I believe that this is our first step toward that opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, Eric, I wanted to give you a chance to give your last sermon, if you will. <laughs> I, I didn't call it that. You did. <laughs> Well, I'm actually going to um, do, do this one from here because okay. it, and 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 kind of ditch the um, uh, the the comments that uh, Martha had asked me to to make here because I, there's so much here in in what you all have been saying that I would like to respond to and and kind of weave together if I can. Um, you know, just on this last note of uh, reentry and second chances. Um, you know, n number one, yes, this is a fundamentally important um, cause for all of us that we're, we all ought to be. Uh, invested in. But number two, you know, what John had to say a moment ago about it uh, is true in a bigger sense. There, there, is a, there, there is a moral lesson in this effort behind reentry, which is simply this. We're all better off when we're all better off. And right now, we are in a state, in this state and in this country right now, where uh, people feel a little bit more like, I don't know about what I got, so I'm going to hoard and keep. Uh, and I'm going to worry about what you got, and I don't, you know, and 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 I'm going to worry in a in a zero sum kind of way, right? And that is at the level of the heart as well as of the head. It's it's at how people respond to each other um, uh, in passing in the street, and it's how people deal with each other in the legislature, right? Uh, and thinking about what it means to say we're all better off when we're all better off means that you're doing things like investing in second chances in reentry, investing in early childhood education, investing in communities and neighborhoods uh, primarily of color where you have disproportionate impacts of the system of mass incarceration. Uh, and you're doing it not because you want to be nice, not because it's charitable or kind, though it may be all of those things, but because it is in our mutual interest to do so. That doing this actually makes our neighborhood, our city, our state, stronger, more robust. And, you know, to put it in, you know, when a team, let's say the Lady Huskies, you know, can field a maximum number of fit and able, com able competitors on the court, that team beats a team that can't, right? And when a state like Connecticut says, you know what, we're just going to actually lop off tens of thousands of people for, from consideration from the talent pool. We're just going to not even see them, much less cultivate them, right? Then guess what? Connecticut doesn't compete well against states that say, you know what, we are going to do reentry. We are going to invest in early learning. We are going to invest in economic opportunity. We are going to reckon with the effects of inequality in this state and not rely only on philanthropy, though philanthropy is good, but recognize that public policy has something to do as well with making sure we bust apart monopolies of opportunity. Right? We're going to circulate that opportunity uh, in this community because why? We're all better off and we're all better off. Right, so that's, that, that's the number one thing I wanted to respond to. The second thing that Ben had to say, um, you know, in, in describing, um, uh, what's the name of the C Civic Life Project? The Civic Life Project, <clears throat> you know, this idea not only of inviting uh, young people to be creative and to make films and, and tell their stories uh, in this way, but uh, the first example that Ben used about, um, you know, asking a question about why, why it is that, what was the example that you used? Uh, what, what makes you angry? Yeah, what makes you angry, right? Um, and you get to what makes you angry, and what you get to 
uh, is, again, this literacy and systems that I was talking about. Now, it may sound, because that's a kind of a wonky way to put it, that I'm talking about something very sophisticated. But I'll tell you about a, actually, uh, our, our kid governor, I believe, is a, is a fifth grader, right? Uh, I, I was at a fifth grade uh, class a couple of years ago talking about some of these questions, and I decided, you know what, I'm not going to water this down anyway. I'm going to ask these kids, what do you think are some of the systems in our life? What, what do systems mean to you, right? And immediately, hands went up. One was like, oh, you mean like how water gets to our water fountain? It's like, yeah, that's a good, that's a good example of system. What else? Uh, you mean like how my favorite cereal gets to the grocery store? Th that's a good example of a system, a market system, right? Uh, you, you mean why... Um, you know, some people uh, go to this place to worship and that place. Yes, right? And people from the youngest to the oldest, from the uh, people with, you know, advanced degrees to people who are, uh, you know, unlettered in this country, people intuit systems. We get it, right? Our job, particularly the people in this room and the, all those who are viewing right now, our job is to spread our knowledge of how systems work and how you work the system. Right? Those two things. How do systems work and how do you work the system? Uh, there, there is no such thing as a neutral system. There is no such thing as some God-given, here's how it ought to be. Right? Every, every allocation we have around everything, from resources to public policy to decisions about uh, how harsh or lenient our criminal justice system should be, um, to you know, whether um, the cap on a payday loan ought to be... you know maybe 50, 60%, or maybe 2,000% uh, interest rate. Nobody said any of these was God-given. These are things that are part of a system that we work, right? And our responsibility to do that is part of what we've been talking about here, but I think it is really amplified when you hear about projects like, um, you know, Brian. You know, so Brian being in the Kiwanis Club. Um, and being, you know, th th there, there is a movement afoot. Uh, I'm glad to hear that more millennials are joining your Kiwanis. There are other organizations. So this generation of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, um, some of them are breathing new life uh, into VFW posts uh, and into the VFW in general. Um, and others are finding new ways altogether to create new institutions and networks um, for them to uh, engage, right? There, there's one called the Mission Continues, ways to activate... Uh, veterans of this generation into uh, service and volunteerism here at home. Um, there, there are pro projects like that. Um, this idea that it has to be only through the old institutions is wrong. We have to open our field of vision and think about what are the new ways, right? Another new way that another millennial is doing actually in New Haven, um, some of you may have heard of See, Click, Fix, right? I see a lot of heads nodding. Ben Berkowitz, uh, my friend there, he and a team of folks uh, uh, have created this very simple app, uh, a, a smartphone app. Uh, you see a pothole, it's not getting filled, it's still not getting filled. You see it, you click, you take a picture of it, um, and this app sends it to your city government. And guess what? You've now created a very interesting feedback loop between those who represent you um, and are supposed to provide service and you, right? Now, that's different from joining Rotary or Kiwanis, right? Uh, uh, and it may not look like traditional forms of civic engagement, but I love it, right? And that idea uh, of empowering people on the ground in that way um, is recognition of another precept that I would want to put before you here. So precept number one was we're all better off when we're all better off, right? This precept is very simple, and all of you have been talking about it in different ways. Society becomes how you behave. Right? So when David talked about the web is, the web is us, right? the web is as uh, hostile and full of uh, misogyny and racism and meanness and horribleness as you know, we want, let it be or want it to be, right? uh, society becomes how you behave. And this goes back to our contagion notion. Uh, it, it, it is not the case, even though we operate oftentimes in American life in this kind of implied narrative that basically says, I should be able to do whatever the heck I want as long as I don't actively harm somebody else. Right? Or a variant of that, I should be as selfish as I possibly can be because a million acts of individual selfishness will somehow add up to a greater good. Actually, a million acts of unchecked selfishness lead to a death spiral 
of social trust and connectedness. The idea that I should be able to do whatever the heck I want is an idea that's practiced really well in places without rule of law, right? But in a place where you want to actually create a baseline of opportunity, trust, compassion, and this recognition that we are woven together and our fates are entwined, that's a different mindset, right? This is a different mindset. And, you know, in this mindset, look, I know that as a matter of governance, Connecticut actually, again, this is a systems thing, uh, because you have whatever it is, 150-some towns, right? 169 towns, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and, every, and you can do the statistics in the aggregate and talk about inequality in the aggregate in this state, but a great majority of those 169 towns are thinking, we're kind of doing okay, right? And because as a matter of governance, they are not in fact linked to other towns, you end up having a dissipation of a sense of shared fate, right? Now, I'm not proposing that you actually, well, I actually do suggest that some of you go, go and think about how you can create new forms of governance that link uh, people up. But even apart from the governance piece, this is, again, a citizen piece. This is a citizen piece of what is your mindset? If I live in Darien, Connecticut, and I think, you know what, what's going on in North Haven or East Haven or, you know, this part of Bridgeport, that's someone else's problem. That's not my problem. You are painfully mistaken. You are in every sense mistaken. You are mistaken materially because the problems of that part of the state are eventually going to be your problems. And you are mistaken morally because that worldview leads to an utter fragmentation of the ideas that the people who established this colony actually believed in when they established this colony, Right? I don't think Connecticut is literally a commonwealth the way Massachusetts is, but it certainly has the ethic of commonwealth, right? The ethic of what are we doing here together? And I think that notion of society becomes how you behave puts on each of us this very simple choice. It's a really simple choice. It doesn't have to be about political science or massive uh, structural change. It's do I choose to see someone else's problem as my problem, right? Or to put it another way, there's no such thing as someone else's problem. And when you get back down to voting, and particularly with young people, or particularly people who feel and indeed are disenfranchised in so many ways, you know, the other way to put that same point when it comes to voting is there's no such thing as not voting. Not voting is voting. Not voting is voting to actively hand power over to people whose interests are often going to be inimical to your own. Right? And so if you like to be bullied, if you like to be dominated by somebody else, if you like someone to run over you over and over again, even when you're given an opportunity to change that, then God bless, go ahead and do that, right? And when you frame it that way, human nature is, well, no, I, I don't like being bullied. I, I don't like being dominated in this way. I don't like being told that I'm just a useless cog with no voice or agency. And yeah, I'm not going to pretend that voting is going to change the world overnight, uh, but it is, again a piece of a larger set of habits, right? And these habits uh, ultimately are what we've got to cultivate in one another. Uh, and meetings like this, and even for the many people who will watch this uh, live and in rebroadcast, um, you know, let's, let's not kid ourselves. We're, I'm preaching to the converted, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the, on the one hand, you can say, well, what good does that do, right? But the point ultimately here is that everybody in this room is a choir master or a congregation leader in her or his own right, right? And that every one of us here has a job to preach and to practice a civic religion that says we're woven together. Society becomes how you behave. We're all better off and we're all better off. And this is what it means to show up as a citizen in American life, right? Our job right now is to make sure that when we leave a place like this, we think about how uh, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, with the young people we work with, with the elders we live with and spend time with, uh, how can we actually not hoard? Everybody in this room has a pile of capital. I, I don't care how rich or poor you are. I mean, you have a pile of capital. You have social capital. You have relationship capital. You have reputational capital. You have all kinds of capital that you can spend in the world, right? And you have a very simple binary choice. Are you going to hoard it, or are you going to invest it in other people, right? And the thing about hoarding is that hoarding kills. It kills the system, and it eventually kills the hoarder. Uh, and so we have a choice here to make ethically about what it means to build 
not the two Connecticut's that I've been hearing about relentlessly since I've come to town, uh, but one Connecticut, one state, one polity, one body, uh, and that there is no way to sever the hand without harming the foot, and that there is no way to forget that we are woven together. And so um, I think we're going to close here uh, with some words of counsel from uh, our uh, kid governor, um, uh, Elena Tipton, who, uh, as I said at the very beginning, um, is not only uh, an inspirational example of a lot of what I'm talking about, because she's decided to show up, because she decided to participate, but also because her whole platform has been about kindness and seeing the ways in which our fates are all connected to one another. So um, thank you all for having me to here today, and thanks to this panel for really just this rich conversation. And uh, uh, let's I toss it let over to the governor Elena. have the last word, because you said society is as you behave, and Elena has been trying to get kids to be more kind to each other. Tell us how that's working out. Working out good. Um, i gotten a lot of emails and that they're taking my suggestions and they're being kind at their school. And you have a blog that kids are reading. What are they saying to you? Um, they're, they're emailing me more suggestions to put in it and they're saying what they've been doing to be kind. Such as? Like they have been um, helping their friends out with like when they're sad they can they've been like making them cards and like some of my friends at my school like they just like help out and I know they always like read my blog and use my kind <laughs> use my suggestions. Elena, I know that you're the technically the governor of the kids, the fifth graders of Connecticut, but um, have any adults been any kinder because of your being in office now with your platform? I'm not sure. <laughs> so I guess that's what we need to find out, huh? <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you to the governor. Thank you to all of you on the panel. Thank you to everyone who was here tonight. And uh, really a wonderful discussion. And even if we are preaching to the converted, we still need to talk about it. So thank you, Eric Liu, and thank you to everyone else tonight. <laughs>